Frost was, was born in, in 1879, I think. Uh, Hart Crane in 1899, representing almost another generation from Frost. Uh, Auden was born in 1906. Uh, Bishop in 1911. Uh, she's the latest, the youngest. <laughs> Uh, in our syllabus, and you know, it's almost, uh, almost two generations uh, uh, distant uh, from, from Robert Frost. <coughs> uh, when I was a freshman at Yale in, in 1976, in April, um, uh, Elizabeth Bishop came to read at Yale. She, um, uh, she's, in a sense, you know, a part of. Uh, uh, a part of our world uh, in a way that the uh, uh, poets that we've been reading really aren't quite. She was uh, uh, good friends with uh, uh, John Hollander, uh, Penelope Lawrence on our faculty, Sandy McClatchy and others. <coughs> uh, she uh, filled the art gallery lecture hall, uh, you know, 400 people. <coughs> um, uh, and this is at a moment, interestingly, when she was not yet at the height of her fame. Uh, she, um, she would uh, uh, become, by the end of the century, uh, a figure as prominent, as often read and widely read and esteemed uh, as any of the poets we've been reading, uh, which is a, a remarkable uh, event in literary culture because uh, Bishop would have seemed to herself and to others uh, through the course of most of her career uh, as an interesting poet, uh, but, as a, uh, but not as a major figure. <coughs> uh, and sh surely she was herself uncomfortable with that kind of stature. Uh, she was, I think it's fair to say, excruciated by public uh, occasions, <coughs> including this one uh, that I'm referring to. <coughs> Listen to her read. I think there, there are some uh, recordings of her on uh, uh, the um, uh, Center for Language Study uh, website. Uh, Bishop has a, a kind of um, uh, exaggeratedly ordinary voice, uh, in the sense a very private voice that she was willing to uh, put on stage, uh, but always only uncomfortably so. Uh, in this particular reading I'm remembering, uh, she, uh, she had read for about 20 minutes and then uh, 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 looked across the stage with these 400 people in front of her uh, at her host, uh, Penelope Lawrence. Is that enough, Penny? Uh, she said. Uh, and of course, uh, people wanted a lot more and a lot more of her. <coughs> uh, but she was reluctant to give it uh, and uncomfortable giving it. <coughs> um, Bishop, in a sense, uh, belongs to um, poetry after modern poetry, poetry after modernism. And, you know, uh, in September I'm going to uh, give a lecture course uh, on poetry after 1950, and we'll start with Bishop and, and pay a lot more attention to her than we have room to do in this course. But uh, Bishop belongs to, uh, in uh, any history of uh, modern poetry, uh, and she provides, a, I think, an important endpoint um, to the work that we've been doing together. Uh, she provides, uh, in a sense, a kind of <coughs> uh, extension of, of um, uh, certain uh, strains of, of modern poetry, and, uh, and also, uh, at the same time, a kind of critique of them. <coughs> uh, Bishop went to Vassar. Uh, and uh, she um, uh, was uh, on the literary magazine there. Uh, and uh, in 1929, I think, uh, she interviewed the uh, important guest uh, on the campus, T.S. Eliot. <coughs> uh, you, you, I, I would have liked to have been in the room. <coughs> uh, she, she wrote, um, uh, well, and, and I guess what I want to highlight is the fact that, well, Bishop was in college reading Eliot and having Eliot visit uh, uh, when uh, she's being, when she's really forming herself as a writer. <coughs> uh, uh, 
she wrote a, um, a paper for one of her courses called Dimensions of the Novel. Uh, and uh, this essay um, <coughs> involved a reading of Eliot's essay, Tradition in the Individual Talent, which you've read and which we've talked about. Uh, Bishop liked it. She was interested in it. <coughs> uh, in her uh, account uh, of uh, the way, way in which she uses Eliot, uh, uh, she um, uh, accents certain aspects uh, of his ideas and, and downplays others. Let me uh, quote from that essay. <coughs> uh, she says, this is on your handout, a constant process of adjustment, and that's Eliot's word, adjustment, uh, is going on about the past. Every ingredient dropped into it from the present must affect the whole. You remember Eliot writing about that in Tradition of Individual <laughs> Talent, where he talks about how the new work uh, sh reshapes everything that's gone before. <coughs> now, what Mr. Eliot says about the sequence of works of art uh, in a tradition, in history, and this is Bishop's extension of Eliot's idea, seems to be equally true of the sequence of events or even of pages or paragraphs in a novel. But I know of no novel that makes use of this constant readjustment among the members of any sequence. So what Bishop's doing is applying Eliot's idea of, of sequence in tradition to the way in which uh, a literary work might itself unfold. That is, where every, uh, as it were, new moment uh, in a novel, here she's talking about a novel, uh, affects a kind of readjustment of what's gone on before. Uh, it, it is, as she's imagining it, um, a l literary form in which there is a kind of continual um, reorientation required by both reader and writer. <coughs> uh, she um, <coughs> uh, uh, takes over specifically that, that phrase, constant uh, readjustment, uh, uh, identifies this as a, a kind of uh, poetics, if, if you will. <coughs> uh, this is really a, a, an important idea in modern poetry generally. And, and you, could, you could look at Eliot's own poetry in, for example, Prufrock uh, as exemplifying something of what Bishop is describing. That is, uh, a poem that unfolds, disclosing at every point new principles of order uh, and perspective. <coughs> uh, it's an idea that, that uh, uh, is, is, in that sense, central to modern poetry, but Bishop takes it and she pushes it in her own work much further. <coughs> uh, she creates in her poetry uh, a radically relative point of view uh, that is adjusted to a kind of metamorphic and decentered world, as she sees it, uh, a world that is living in change. Uh, that phrase uh, you might remember from the very end of uh, Primitive Like an Orb, uh, Stevens's great late poem. Uh, and Bishop is in many ways a Stevensian poet, a poet of, of change, constant change. Uh, but significantly, in Bishop's imagination, as in Auden's, there are no Stevensian giants, no, no uh, major men, <coughs> no large men reading. <coughs> uh, the poet uh, in Bishop's poetry describes the world rather than creates it. Uh, the, the, the poet uh, is not like God. Uh, as uh, the poet is in Stevens. <coughs> the poet is much more like an ordinary person, <coughs> uh, a woman on stage uh, in a skirt, uh, uh, speaking uh, uncomfortably, if you like, to uh, a large audience <coughs> in an ordinary voice. Her poetry is, in fact, full of ordinary people. Uh, and this links her to Frost. <coughs> uh, there are, well, generally uh, few uh, 
uh, oh, um, uh, emblematic or archetypal figures such as you find in Yeats or, or in Moore's poetry, <laughs> uh, or often, uh, for that matter, in Auden's. <coughs> uh, there is in Bishop uh, really no uh, sublime, uh, no, uh, no Yeatsian uh, ascent uh, out of the foul rag and bone shop of the heart. Uh, there's no cranian verticality, uh, no uh, 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 you know, Icarus-like uh, ascent of the sky. <coughs> Instead, uh, Bishop's poetics of description are what I would call a kind of horizontal poetics uh, that moves laterally, that is earthbound and is concerned with, in a sense, this is her primary recurrent trope, mapping the world. Uh, giving an account of the Earth's surface. Uh, uh, it's a perceptual poetics that she's concerned with, uh, something she calls geography or sometimes travel. The uh, uh, poem that really inaugurates Bishop's uh, mature writing uh, and that she placed first in her uh, first uh, volume of poetry, North and South, uh, and that subsequently was placed first in all uh, collected uh, volumes of her poems, is the poem called The Map. Uh, it's a kind of preface to her work, uh, and it's an inevitable place to start uh, thinking about her. Uh, so let's look at it together. <coughs> uh, a poem written in um, uh, I believe uh, at least begun uh, New Year's Eve uh, 1933 <coughs> uh, as Bishop um, uh, left college. <coughs> Maybe you seniors will write your own map next year. Um, she uh, uh, didn't collect it uh, in a book until uh, 1946, uh, which is her, her first book publication. <coughs> Uh, like Stevens, like Frost, uh, she's uh, uh, slow to uh, uh, gather her, her first poems. <coughs> the poem begins with uh, a marvelous, uh, uh, limpid clarity. Land lies in water. It is shadowed green. Shadows, or are they shallows, at its edges? showing the line of long, seaweeded ledges where weeds hang to the simple blue from green? Or does the land lean down to lift the sea from under, drawing it unperturbed around itself? Along the fine, tan, sandy shelf, is the land tugging at the sea from under? It's a deceptively declarative, flat voice, a voice of description. <coughs> uh, it is interestingly impersonal and intimate at once. Uh, it's as if uh, uh, we were so close to her she need not introduce herself. <coughs> we are invited uh, to look over her shoulder with her at the map. Uh, she doesn't, as I say, introduce herself or her subject really here. Uh, she just starts. <coughs> uh, the poem represents itself as happening now, uh, as if it were recording the mind in action, uh, a process in action of perception. <coughs> uh, the poem was gathered first for publication by Marianne Moore, who was uh, Bishop's friend and mentor uh, described a friendship described in uh, Bishop's long, beautiful, funny uh, memoir, Efforts of Affection, that I asked you to read when we were reading Moore, uh, an essay that tells you a lot about Moore, but also tells you a lot about Bishop. Uh, Moore, uh, as her mentor, gathered this and three, uh, two, excuse me, two other poems. Uh, and um, uh, had it published in a, a volume in which an older poet presented a younger uh, as a 
uh, teacher or mentor uh, would uh, present a protege. Uh, Moore says about Bishop's poems a number of interesting things. I've sampled uh, just these sentences uh, on your handout. Some authors do not muse within themselves, but by contrast, Bishop does. <coughs> they, they, those other authors, think <coughs> like the vegetable shredder which cuts into the life of a thing. <laughs> Miss Bishop is not one of these frettingly intensive machines. Yet, the rational considering quality in her work is its strength. The rational considering quality, assisted by unwordiness, uncontorted intentionalness, phrases that only Marianne Moore could have produced, uh, the flicker of impudence, the natural unforced ending. <coughs> uh, these are, are, are important uh, qualities of, of Bishop's writing. Um, uh, although, <coughs> to um, highlight them is to risk a sort of misperception. That is, if Bishop presents herself as a kind of rational, considering intelligence in these poems, um, what she very rapidly uncovers uh, is um, uh, fantasy uh, and uh, the fantastic uh, or fabulous or metaphorical. <coughs> Uh, just so, her poetry of percep perception and description, rather than um, uh, uh, giving us a, a kind of poetics of objectivity that we might associate with pound and imagism, uh, very quickly uh, turns back on the perceiving subject to ask questions about the process of perception itself and to suddenly become a poetry very much about subjectivity. Uh, you can see this going on already uh, in um, uh, the lines that I've uh, quoted here. Uh, uh, Bishop no sooner says one thing uh, than uh, she elaborates it uh, or questions it. Uh, shadows or are they shallows, she says. <coughs> uh, she's formulated one idea uh, and then she asks a question about it. and then. A further question about that. Uh, this is uh, uh, very much uh, an image, uh, a poetics of a mind in action, a mind thinking. Uh, that is the, the drama uh, that Bishop uh, shares with us. Uh, in another um, uh, early uh, statement, uh, this in a uh, um, uh, letter to um, uh, a poet, Donald Stanford, she quotes uh, a literary critic uh, on Baroque, that is, uh, 17th century prose, which she liked. <coughs> uh, and, and this quotation is also on your handout. Uh, th there, that is, uh, the writers of Baroque prose, their purpose was to portray not a thought, but a mind thinking. They knew that an idea separated from the act of experiencing it is not the idea that was experienced. The ardor of its conception in the mind, that's my misprint, is a necessary part of its truth. The ardor of the conception in the mind is uh, what Bishop wants. Uh, ardor, that's an important uh, word. It suggests uh, passion, uh, a certain amount of heat, uh, emotion, uh, and heart. <coughs> um, in Bishop's case, this ardor is communicated sometimes through the deceptively uh, cool manner of self-interrogation, uh, and in particular through the grammatical uh, form of the question. <coughs> uh, here uh, in this very first paragraph of her poetry, uh, Bishop is asking questions. <coughs> Uh, there's a kind of level of clarity and detail in her observations uh, that makes what she's looking at interestingly unstable and uncertain. She turns back on it, asks questions about it. <coughs> you could contrast uh, uh, Bishop's questions with Yeats's great rhetorical questions. Uh, a, a, uh, uh, a form that we, we uh, uh, stressed in, in reading Leda and the Swan and other 
uh, late Yeats poems. Uh, in general, uh, thinking about uh, Bishop's relationship to Yeats, you could say that Romance Quest, which is this, you know, essential structure that's uh, uh, behind all of Yeats's poetry, <coughs> Romance Quest has come down in Bishop to the act of asking questions, uh, raising questions. Uh, here in this poem, uh, and very frequently in other Bishop poems, questions specifically about boundaries, about the way in which we categorize uh, and frame the world, uh, how we uh, draw lines uh, and uh, separate and connect things at the same time. <coughs> Uh, as we do, one thing seems to turn into uh, another. Uh, opposites interact. Uh, uh, opposites are involved. Uh, and notice the, the pair of opposites that she's uh, uh, stressing here, land and water. Uh, these are, are primary categories that her poetry centers itself on over and over again. Bishop is a poet of the seashore. Uh, there are um, uh, poems uh, throughout her career that station themselves on the beach, uh, in particular, um, a place of uh, um, unstable, uh, uncertain, dynamic boundary. <coughs> uh, you can see the same kind of play of uh, similarity and difference uh, between terms in Bishop's poetry on a formal level already working here in this first stanza. Uh, it is rhymed poetry, isn't it? Uh, but what an interesting set of rhymes. <coughs> uh, green, edges, ledges, green. <coughs> uh, under, itself, shelf, under. Uh, these are our, our rhymes where uh, uh, it seems as though words are a little too close together, they're repeated green, or, or maybe a little uh, too far apart. Uh, in the second stanza, then, uh, the rhyme scheme gives way entirely. This is, and this is like Bishop, to set up one pattern and then drop it. The shadow of Newfoundland lies flat and still. Labrador's yellow where the moony Eskimo has oiled it. <coughs> we can stroke these lovely bays under a glass as if they were expected to blossom, or as if to provide a clean cage for invisible fish. The names of seashore towns run out to sea. The names of cities cross the neighboring mountains. The printer here, experiencing the same excitement as when emotion too far exceeds its cause. These peninsulas take the water between thumb and finger like women feeling for the smoothness of yard goods. <coughs> then the rhyme scheme returns. Uh, and again, it's a peculiar one that includes uh, not just a rhyme but a repetition of, of uh, particular words. Mapped waters, she says, are more quiet than the land is, lending the, la the waves, <coughs> excuse me, lending the land their waves own conformation. And Norway's hair runs south in agitation. Profiles investigate the sea where land is. Are they assigned, or can the countries pick their colors? what suits the character or the native waters best. Topography displays no favorites, north's as near as west. More delicate than the historians are the map makers' colors. Uh, it's a, a, a poetry like aspects of Yeats, like aspects of Moore's, uh, that presents itself with uh, uh, a kind of um, resolute uh, 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 clarity and um, uh, simplicity of uh, lucidity of, of um, 
uh, language that sometimes seems to feel uh, like prose. <coughs> uh, there is uh, lyric power here, uh, but it's got at um, through uh, a language, uh, again, um, uh, close to that of ordinary life. <coughs> As Bishop uh, observes uh, the boundaries that she's talking about here, the sea and the shore. She's also concerned with another set of opposed terms and ones that will follow her throughout her poetry, and that is the difference between the real and representation, and the ways in which representation, that which is represented, can take on a certain kind of reality itself uh, as uh, she fancifully allows uh, the um, uh, forms of the map to do here. Uh, the map really becomes a world, and uh, not only a representation of it, <coughs> and the poet plunges really imaginatively into it, takes us with her as she does, <coughs> uh, entering the versions of life that it suggests to her. In that third stanza there, though, as she returns to that peculiar rhyme scheme, there's a certain kind of um, uh, holding back, uh, uh, gathering of her intelligence, uh, and reflection on the process uh, that she's been engaged in. What emerges there is a kind of key idea, the one I've already mentioned, geography or topography here. <coughs> uh, geography topography, they uh, display no favorites. They represent a uh, poetics uh, 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 that is hmm, non-hierarchical in its orientation. And again, this is a link to Moore. <coughs> uh, Bishop is interested in a point of view that takes no sides, uh, except to suggest, to insist on the relativity of all cognitive categories. North's as near as west. It always is, right? Uh, that is, it's as near to the perceiver, whose perspective is constantly shifting, constantly readjusted. Uh, I talked about perspectivism in, in Auden. Uh, well, uh, Bishop uh, has uh, uh, has a hold of the same idea uh, and will make it even more central, make it more thematically central to her work uh, than even Auden. <coughs> uh, uh, the um, um, opposition that she uh, ends with uh, is the one between the historian and the map maker. Uh, she presents herself here clearly on the side of the map maker, <coughs> one whose colors, colors of rhetoric uh, are more delicate than the historians. And on the side of the historian, who could we place? Perhaps Yeats, perhaps Pound, perhaps Eliot. <coughs> uh, certainly uh, uh, Bishop's great uh, contemporary, Robert Lowell. <coughs> uh, Bishop presents herself as uh, engaged in a poetics of geography and of map making uh, that is more delicate than that of the historian. In that word delicacy, uh, there is certainly um, uh, some um, uh, uh, implication uh, of gender. <coughs> um, the opposition between the map maker and the historian, well, it would be too simple to uh, uh, call it an opposition between um, uh, woman and uh, man, uh, and yet um, uh, gendered terms are, are, are uh, uh, there in Bishop's language, I think. <coughs> uh, this poem, uh, as I suggested, is uh, composed uh, in 1933, <coughs> uh, after uh, Bishop has, has left Vassar, has um, uh, made friends with Moore, uh, who uh, uh, will be a, a central figure in her life. Uh, if, in some sense, emotion 
might uh, uh, exceed its cause, uh, might uh, lead Bishop to get carried away, <coughs> uh, there were lots of reasons why this might be so. Uh, Bishop uh, grew up uh, at first uh, in Nova Scotia. Uh, she is uh, a Canadian poet as much as an American poet, <coughs> a poet uh, uh, of uncertain national identity, you might say. Uh, her father died uh, when I believe she was five. Uh, her mother, uh, in grief, uh, went mad uh, and was uh, institutionalized, <coughs> uh, and Bishop was separated from her, uh, so that she grew up very much as um, an orphan. Uh, much has been made of her biography. Um, I wouldn't encourage you to, um, because uh, Bishop herself uh, treats it um, uh, as a, uh, an important frame and resonance for her poetry, but not as a rule uh, as its subject. <coughs> uh, there is, I think, uh, simply the important point to be made that uh, here is a poet who grew up uh, with uh, a certain primary sense of dislocation and disorientation and an acute sense of divided identity. Uh, uh, biographical facts that, in a sense, lead us very quickly uh, into the uh, ethical and cognitive problems that, that are central to um, uh, Bishop's work. And, and, and I think uh, to this problem in particular, how do you hold yourself together? Uh, it's, it's, a, uh, uh, it's an important one, uh, and one that we all in various ways struggle with. <coughs> uh, Bishop finds various ways to raise that question, uh, to figure it and explore it. Uh, one early amusing uh, and suggestive uh, instance uh, is the poem called The Gentleman of Shalott. Uh, and I'd like to look at that with you to um, uh, get a little more sense of Bishop's poetics <coughs> uh, and <coughs> some uh, uh, sense of her early self-conception as a poet. <coughs> uh, remember the idea that she's taken from Eliot. Uh, she wants to imagine a kind of writing uh, that would include time in it, that would include change in it, uh, in which the organization of the whole would be constantly <laughs> subject to readjustment. Uh, a text that would incorporate flux, <coughs> uh, a text that would be determined locally uh, rather than by some uh, global uh, and uh, general perspective. Uh, the, I think, um, unstable orders of a poem like Prufrock are important for Bishop, and that Prufrock is, in fact, a figure behind uh, this one of Bishop's, the Gentleman of Shalott. Uh, Bishop's character is a kind of dandy like Prufrock. Um, Bishop is also, at the same time, playing with Tennyson uh, and his poem, The Lady of Shalott. <coughs> Uh, a kind of gender switch has, has occurred uh, in Bishop's poem. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, well, I'll leave you to ponder it, uh, but I think that uh, one way to understand her, her joke here, uh, I'm not going to write about the Lady of Shalott, I'm going to write about the Gentleman of Shalott. <coughs> uh, uh, one way to understand her joke here uh, is to suggest that this poem is in part about what it means for Bishop to be a woman poet. Uh, and it implies that uh, that meant for her a certain kind of gender switch, <coughs> uh, a sex change, uh, and one that might uh, introduce a certain amount of stress, uh, as well as comedy. Uh, well, uh, let's, uh, uh, let's listen to some of it. <coughs> uh, which eyes, his eye? Which limb lies next the mirror? Her joke is that the gentleman of Shalott, like the lady of Shalott, <laughs> is fixated on a mirror 
but the mirror that uh, uh, is um, uh, in place here is one that, uh, as she'll describe it, goes down the body, splits this figure, creates a kind of divided figure. <coughs> uh, which limb lies next the mirror? For neither is clearer nor a different color than the other, nor meets a stranger in this arrangement of leg and leg and arm and so on. <laughs> to his mind, it's the indication of a mirrored reflection somewhere along the line of what we call the spine. He felt in modesty his person was half looking glass, for why should he be doubled? The glass must stretch down his middle, or rather, down the edge. But he's in doubt as to which side's in or out of the mirror. There's a little margin for error, but there's no proof either. And if half his head's res reflected, thought, he thinks, might be affected. Uh, this is a poetry that presents itself as light verse. Uh, in that way, it's a, again like much of early Auden. <coughs> uh, and yet it is a poem that is secretly very serious. Uh, the, uh, uh, well, much of the lightness as well as the seriousness of the poem uh, depends on its formal organization. Uh, these lines are, well, aren't they about half as long as uh, <laughs> A, a normative line of poetry, uh, and they're rhymed, uh, but they're rhymed in, in a most interesting and playful way. In fact, the poem has a lot of play in it. Uh, the pleasure that it gives is uh, one of a certain mild exhilaration and uncertainty, of a pattern that includes and that, in fact, tolerates or even generates dramatic change in line length and surprising rhymes. Uh, the gentleman is, in a sense, trying to hold himself together. <coughs> uh, the idea is repeated by the poet trying to hold her lines together uh, in rhymed couplets. <coughs> uh, Bishop is, in general, a very interesting poet, technically. <coughs> uh, here, as elsewhere, how relaxed how unpretentiously uh, casual, uh, uh, how disorientingly casual even the voice is. Uh, there isn't here or elsewhere in Bishop Frost's tension between speech and meter. Uh, rather, as in this case, each keeps getting adjusted to the other. Uh, it's important. There's almost no blank verse, no iambic pentameter in Bishop. She, uh, the canonical heroic meter doesn't appear here, uh, <coughs> except I think possibly in, in one uh, or two examples. Uh, there are in Bishop uh, free verse poems. There's meter and rhyme. Uh, there are often uh, po poems that move in and out of these forms, much as the map begins in rhyme, moves out of rhyme, and returns to rhyme. Uh, the poems don't seek Moore's highly idiosyncratic, crafted formal arrangements. Uh, uh, instead, Bishop's practice is probably closest to Auden's, who's got a form for every occasion, form for every purpose. <coughs> but Auden's forms are always, in a sense, preset, drawn from an existing repertoire. What is right for this occasion? A ballad. I will do a ballad. Uh, a sestina, uh, 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 elegiac uh, quatrains, uh, etc. Uh, that's uh, the way in which Auden presents himself. <coughs> uh, and Auden adheres strictly to his forms. Uh, uh, and he uses those forms to shape and interpret the occasions of his writing. In Bishop's case, it's really just the other way around. Uh, what she does is uh, uh, alter her forms under the pressure of the occasions of her writing, uh, her purpose and subject. Nothing in Bishop is preset. Everything is provisional uh, in the process of being remade, uh, uh, in a process of constant readjustment. Uh, on a technical level, as well as on the 
uh, perceptual level uh, that I began by talking about. Um, this is a, a vision, really, of what the world is like uh, and how writing might uh, respond to it. <coughs> All of these things are going on in this little poem, um, <coughs> uh, the, the Gentleman of uh, Shalott, uh, and, and uh, with uh, a sense of, of comedy. If the glass slips, he's in a fix, only one leg, etc. But while it stays put, so long as we accept this provisional arrangement, he can walk and run, and his hands can clasp one another. The uncertainty, he says he finds exhilarating. He loves, and here's that phrase from the essay on, on Eliot, that sense of constant readjustment. He wishes to be quoted as saying at present, half is enough a kind of motto that Bishop might have adopted, too. Let's look uh, uh, at uh, another version of this figure, um, a, uh, uh, this time not a person uh, but uh, a creature, uh, and uh, I mean specifically the sandpiper uh, who uh, uh, appears uh, in uh, a much later book. Uh, Questions of Travel, <coughs> uh, from um, uh, a book written largely in the 1950s and early 1960s. Sandpiper is on page 131. Uh, again, uh, it is a uh, poem that takes place on the shore. Instead of the gentleman of Shalott uh, uh, in his uh, um, uh, fussy way uh, and yet practical way, um, uh, getting along in the world, we are introduced to a finicky bird. <coughs> the roaring alongside he takes for granted, and that every so often the world is bound to shake. He runs, he runs to the south, finical, awkward, in a sense of controlled panic. A student of Blake. Uh, another poem that is stationed on a shifting boundary, the boundary of the tide. Uh, Bishop is engaged here in a kind of playful, active uh, revision of the visionary innocence celebrated by William Blake. Uh, I, I uh, uh, quote the lines on your handout that, that uh, Bishop is referring to. To see a world in a grain of sand, this is the uh, beginning of Auguries of Innocence, and heaven in a wildflower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand, and eternity in an hour. Uh, well, uh, here Bishop is sort of playfully saying, uh, well, what kind of figure is, is really Blakey, and what kind of figure wants to see the world in a grain of sand? Well, a sandpiper uh, looking for his food. The beach hisses like fat. On his left, a sheet of interrupting water comes and goes and glazes over his dark and brittle feet. He runs. He runs straight through it, watching his toes. Watching, rather, and this is, again, Bishop correcting her, proceeding by correcting her perception, watching, rather, the spaces of sand between them, where no detail too small, and again the sandpiper, like the poet, is focused on detail. The Atlantic drains rapidly backwards and downwards. As he runs, he stares at the dragging grains. The world is a mist, and then the world is vast and minute <coughs> and clear. The tide is higher or lower. He couldn't tell you which. North is near as west. His beak is focused. He is preoccupied, looking for something, something, something. Poor bird. He is obsessed. The millions of grains are black, white, tan, and gray, mixed with quartz grains, rose, and amethyst. The poem's own structure shifts, uh, interestingly, uh, in terms of its uh, line lengths <coughs> uh, uh, and uh, uh, Bishop's ways of using enjambment or end stopped. 
lines. Uh, the world is, well, uh, uh, the world is a place of vast forces, uh, of roaring, of mist, uh, and yet it's also minute uh, and clear. All of these things at once <coughs> or in succession. Uh, the bird's perspective uh, uh, can't tell us uh, whether the tide is higher or lower uh, because he is, as it were, in the picture. He's always wherever it is. <laughs> Uh, it is a, a position, again, of constant readjustment. <coughs> what is he looking for? Something, something, something. Uh, a calculatedly vague word, uh, a word that we see Frost using in for once then something. Uh, instead of moving here towards generalization, <coughs> The poem moves <coughs> towards more detail, towards a list, a series, finally, of colors, simply. Uh, uh, in a sense, Bishop moves away from the black and white to other shades, uh, uh, shades that involve combinations of colors. Uh, the, uh, uh, the question is really, how can the world be seen <coughs> serially? How can it be made, how can it be seen as a series of perceptions and yet able to cohere? Uh, this, is, this is a fundamental question of, of Bishop's poetry. It is, as it were, uh, the complement of the question, how can you hold yourself together? Well, how can you hold the world together? How can you hold the world that you perceive together? Uh, Bishop's uh, great poem uh, on this subject uh, is the travel poem, Over 2,000 Illustrations and a Complete Concordance, which I promise to talk about on Monday.